So the agenda from 5 to 520, Simon Hoskins, USA Field Hockey's Executive Director, will be talking about protecting and preserving college field hockey. Then we'll move to the Stanford situation featuring Allison, Elise, and Kathy, the safe Stanford field hockey team leaders. Next, we'll move to the pilot California State Chapter, where Kendall Beveridge, the California State President, will give us a quick overview. And finally, we will turn to Simon Hoskins and Chip Rogers, our USA Field Hockey Board member and Miami University Assistant Coach, to do wrap up and next steps. Thank you, Sally, and good evening all. Thank you so much for taking the time this evening for this really important topic. And thank you most of all for caring about our awesome sport. Um, and also uh, a thank you to uh, the great people um, who will be following and speaking today, uh, the leaders from State Stanford Field Hockey and from the California State Chapter. So let, if I can, I'll take a few minutes to set some context as well, which is about um, hockey in, in the US. So first of all, USA Field Hockey. We're, we're the national governing body, the NGB, and that comes from an appointment by the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee. Our overall mission is to, is to we, we, we have it in three strands, to grow the game, ever more people playing and, and in, involved in every part of the sport, to serve members, we are a membership organization, and to succeed internationally, perhaps what we're best known for is leading our USA teams. Now we are a nonprofit, so everything we do is about um, giving to the sport and we have to scrap for every dollar. There's no magic money tree. We don't receive government funding. Uh, and a huge thank you for all of, the, all of you who are engaged in the sport and USA field hockey programming. That's what fuels the resources that come from all our programming, fuels our ability to fulfill our mission, to grow the sport, serve members, succeed internationally. Um, we are about, as you can see on the slide, everyone. We want everyone to be involved in the sport. We're really committed to being inclusive. Um, you can see that we have um, our, our mission and our values to cover all those groups that you see uh, listed on, on the slide. And it's about lifetime engagement. So um, from, from the beginning of the field hockey experience right through, we'd love people to be engaged um, all their lives. And we have made strides in that in, in the recent year. So if you can move to the next slide, uh, and I'd like to, to dive in a bit into NCAA hockey. And we are so fortunate. I have the benefit of being in another country where we don't have this awesome platform that is NCAA hockey. It's a beautiful thing, and it's really important to our, our sports infrastructure. It's central in its role in the fabric of, of our sport. There's 278 programs. We're used to seeing that, and we all on this call are, are deeply passionate about field hockey, but to be clear, not, not all Olympic sports have nearly as much engagement with the NCAA. We, we are in a very fortunate position. And there's much more than that, of course, as well. And you can see some, some of the statements there, and let me elaborate on, on some of them. Um, we have the highest proportion of female coaches and umpires. We have one of the highest four-year four graduation rates amongst all sports. And really important, and I know we all know this, but I really want to remind us of the great values that our sport have in leadership, teamwork, perseverance, confidence, competitiveness, friendships, most of all fun. And these are the core values that, that are in our sport and in NCAA field hockey. It gives countless benefits to all those involved. And, and more than that, it, and this is borne out by research from EY from ESPNW, from the Women's Sports Foundation, studies have proved the correlation of success on the field with success in business and in life. It's a, our sport is, is wonderful for developing people. The NCAA also provides this road to, to lifetime engagement, keeping people in the sport, showing them the opportunities, and then transitioning to adult engagement in many different ways, not only as adult players and and masters players, but also as on-pass coaches, volunteers, administrators, donors, and way more. It also, NCAA gives this umbrella platform for engagement in high school field hockey. 
We have a, a, a thriving high school of field hockey, and we're, we're, we're really ever more engaged in that. Of course, the scholarship opportunities are linked very closely, but there's no doubt that a successful NCAA leads to ever more success at our sport and being engaged at high school. We've talked about the adults and masters and all those, all of you on the call, um, who stay engaged in the sport are so important to driving the next generation and driving the growth of, of youth. At the elite level, the NCAA is, is the top development and elite league for US athletes aged approximately 19 to 22, as well as some international players. And it's really, this is not, this is unique to us. Nearly all, in fact, sometimes all of our Olympic team, our national team, have our NCAA athletes. That's something we can all be hugely proud of. And many of you have, have played such an important role in, in developing national team athletes. So you see a map and, and you can see some numbers on there too. This is where, um, by state, where we have, our sport has NCAA programs. And we, we know we're really strong in the Northeast. We'd love to be covering every state. Um, but what you can see, that the reality that we have is that as you move uh, west, away from the heartland of Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland, and more, collegiate programs are, uh, are not as prevalent. And you can see the numbers on there of the amount of collegiate programs within each state. And then you can move across a gap, a desert, to the island of California, which now has uh, two programs. And, and that, is, that is a big challenge for our sport and something we, we all need to recognize. And it's going to be a central topic of this call. We have the, the big concerns when, as Sally mentioned, Missouri State dropped in 2017, Pacific in 2018, and that eroded the California program to, to three schools. And then the big shock in July of, of last year with uh, the, the dropping of the Stanford program, leaving as it stands at this point of, of two programs in California, which is a big concern to, to all of us. And it's, it's an even broader concern because of the, the fact that the two collegiate programs, the, the, um, it became there's a knock-on effect on the fabric of the sport in California at the youth, middle, and high school, um, and it becomes ever more problematic. So we're really focused and honed in on, on California. Of course, it's where ultimately Los Angeles 2028 will be. So we have an ever more uh, uh, eye and a, a focus and uh, resources towards California. And it's so important to all of us that hockey stays in the Olympics and we deliver an incredible hockey experience in California at LA 28. So on this slide, you'll see the, the role, the actions and the visions of, of what we as a national governing body can provide to college field hockey. And I'd like to do a quick recap of where, where we've been because it's not for many national governing bodies, and, and I speak to many colleagues in our role, Sally's role in, in our, uh, other sports. And for a long period of time, national governing bodies were, were not that involved in, in NCAA and, and the collegiate space. But and this has changed in recent years, and I'll give you a few examples of, of the context so we can then talk about the roles and actions. In, in 2016, recognizing how important the NCAA infrastructure is to the fabric of sport in America. The United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee created the Department of Collegiate Partnerships. And at that same time, we started to work really closely with Sarah Wilhelmy and her colleagues. And some samples of some work we've been doing with them include um, surveying college coaches to assess programs at risk in, in 17, um, issuing starter packages of goals and goals goalkeeper equipment for new college, new high school, new club programs. We looked in 2018 uh, and provided a report on college and high school games to, to raise awareness. In 19, we created the college Sustain and Grow Advocacy Group, which was cross-functional with ADs, SWAs, college coaches, um, and many others uh, who, are, who represent the infrastructure of the sport. And in January 2020, with a call to action about what is good for the game, we, we led with recommendations. Regrettably, of course, in came COVID, which was so damaging to so much of us in March, and that that really limited um, 
some of our ambitions in this area, although they remain ambitions, but we were not able to act as quickly as we could. Uh, I'm sure you can understand and some, we had less resources, both human and financial, and soon we'll be out of uh, this COVID period. We all hope, and I'm sure that is the case. And more recently, we formed a really important partnership with uh, the National Federation of State High School Association, and we have a high school advocacy group uh, working closely with, with high schools as well. Many, many NCAA programs have been cut. Some have been reinstated, but this is a huge, huge concern for any, anyone who cares about sport at every level, is the future of collegiate programs at NCAA. So we are now moving from a strategy of sustaining growth to protect and preserve. This is our reality and everyone else's as well. We have played a role and Sally and I are very involved with the USAPC working on the NCAA think tank which is really about re rethinking, using this period we're in to, to rethink how college sports can be, to make sure that it's sustainable and the awesome thing that we have in the NCAA continues for future generations. Their recommendations will be out in Q1 later this year or later this first part of this year. And uh, we, we have worked hard to make sure field hockey and field hockey dynamics are at the front of this. Now there have been ads and that's great, in, in particularly in D2 and D3 and big, big shout out to Chip and, and many others who've, who've worked on this as well as like Lycoming, Lincoln Memorial, Medai, Meredith, who've added programs. So that's a great thing and we want to encourage ever more of that. But to be clear on, on, on the role of how we see the, the impact we can make and you can see some of the things that we can do and we can be leaders and advocate for change, work on the infrastructure, we can provide support, some of the things I, I just listed, and we can um, really empower the key folks around us to really champion our sport. What we can't do, and, and again, to be clear on this, is we can't be everything to all things and be realistic where USC Fiocchi is made up of people who care passionately about the sport, um, but we also have to tread carefully and, and walk the fine line, and we can't do things that are outside of our governance. Um, but we can do, and we will continue to do, great um, advocacy for our sport. So in terms of, of actions, things like tonight are really important. The sharing of best practice, improving the communication is really at the heart of some of the actions, and we'll talk some more, and we'll listen to you of other things that we can do to help, to help our sport. Um, but ultimately, that, that is our, our vision, as you can see, is to, is to work with the NCAA and all the folks who provide the infrastructure of the sport to make college hockey more sustainable and desirable for college programs to be sponsored. So if we can turn to the, to the next slide, please. These are the big questions that, that face us. How, can we, be, how we, can we better support, sustain, protect, and grow college field hockey? What can we learn from each other? And we're gonna do some great learnings in, in a minute. What can we learn from other sports? And, and Sally leads a, a group who works closely with other sports. And what can we learn from the Stanford situation to apply for the good of the game? And I'd like to leave, leave my, my opening with uh, one last a set of thoughts, which is we cannot be complacent in field hockey. Um, it is not a right that our sport is, is well represented within the NCAA. Um, and this is really important that the people before us and some, some people on this tour, but people before us have worked really hard to get us into this situation where we have a thriving NCAA environment. And, and they had to overcome many obstacles and we, we're well aware of our history of our sport. We cannot sit back. We have a, a, a role to play to make sure we continue and that NCAA, NCAA field hockey thrives. Thank you, Simon. Um for your leadership on this and for your commitment to working to preserve and protect college field hockey. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Allison Smith to share the Stanford situation. Um, thank you very much, Simon, for that introduction. I wanna begin by reflecting that how USA Field Hockey has really shaped my entire career from high school um, through college and beyond. Um, I've been coached by Olympians and national team players from day one of my hockey journey. And 
um, they've just been, been there at every turn, this moment included. And I wanna thank all of you on the call for joining as well. Um, I hope that you all will stay with us through this fight. I graduated from Stanford in 89, and I'm joined today by my colleagues, Elise Ogle from the class of 14, and Kathy Levinson from the class of 77. Um, the three of us are representing a village of highly engaged teammates who contributed to the work that you're gonna see here tonight, and that uh, really comes from generations of more than 400 alumni from Stanford. I'm also joined in the, the webinar by Melissa Weiss, um, a fellow master's player, and Linda De Los Reyes, and both of whom will help us respond to questions that you might pose in the chat. So tonight, what we'd like to share is our experience and the status of our fight, describe some of the lessons learned that we'll hope, uh, we really hope will help you preserve and protect your programs and, and, and conclude with the call to action where we're asking for your help. So just briefly, I'm gonna provide a brief context and talk a little bit about our strategy and goals. Elise will talk about some of our organization and communication. Kathy will touch on some of the most recent developments in our collaboration and we'll pause on a, a call to action. Some of the lessons learned that you'll see as a theme through here um, really are talking about keeping tabs and keeping connections with your alumni, strategically spotlighting the contributions of your teammates on and off the field before and after graduation, uh, networking with key stakeholders and influencers within your university and beyond, collaborating with other teams, and no surprise, um, talking about money and fundraising. Notably, none of these skills are typically taught in coaching clinics. So we acknowledge that being a coach and running a program in today's environment um, is an enormous challenge already, just preparing your athletes physically and mentally for competition, navigating recruiting rules, um, you know, preparing for uh, competition schedules and travel, the list goes on. But one of the key lessons um, is that winning a, here, winning a national championship alone is not um, an answer uh, to protect your program. So we're going to dive in here with a little bit of context for those of you who are may not be familiar with some of the Stanford's background. As a mid-sized university with an enormous $28 billion budget, um, we internally boast about being the home of champions because we've hosted 36 sports, more women's sports than men's, and in fact, uh, when Title IX was originally passed, Stanford decided to lean into uh, the, the opportunity to support women's sports um, and, and, you know, to this day has had more women's sports than, than men's. There's a long list of laurels here with national championships, uh, 25 consecutive years of earning the Director's Cup, you know, Olympic athletes, Olympic medals, Rhodes Scholars. The point of this uh, slide is not to boast. The point of this slide is to say that if it can happen at Stanford, it can happen anywhere. So as Simon mentioned, it was on July 8th when Stanford announced its decision um, to cut 11 uh, varsity teams, citing that there was no pathway to excellence for these teams and it had exhausted all other solutions. So you can see that that inclu included 22 hockey players, three coaches, our 400 hockey alum, and many more when you, when you multiply that out across all the other 11 sports. Um, as hard as it has been um, for all of us to not have very much hockey playing this year because of postponed seasons, um, I think deeply every day about the 22 women on this team who face not having another season at all. That includes Kelsey Bing and Corinne Zanoli, current US team players, and, and their teammates who have had the rug just cut out from under them. So they're, they're living this dream of their academic and athletic um, you know, life right now, and it has been, it's been crushed. So it's with deep empathy that we reacted to this um, and felt also as alumni dismissed because we weren't approached for collaborative solution seeking early on in the prior before the decision, we felt underappreciated for the contributions that we had made to the legacy, we felt underestimated for our ability to organize and undervalued for our ability uh, to give. So these are the things that um, remind me that, you know, with women, when women with sticks get mad, um, sort of look up, look out, because we're going to step up and, and speak out. So the alumni um, stepped up, they stormed, formed, normed, and uh, really to help in this effort. And out of that original initial fog um, emerged a strategy. 
where we fo first focused on targeted outreach to, to our stakeholders, meaning decision makers at the university and with targeted communications and outreach, trying to have a conversation and trying to seek um, ways to, pathways to reinstatement. We also wanted to sustain the public pressure. So that meant through our social channels and other media outlets. And then also we embarked early on to develop what we are named, you know, our mean, lean fighting uh, fundraising machine. Our obvious, obviously our objectives were to achieve reinstatement, um, to endow the program in perpetuity and to move quickly so that we could retain the team and the coach before the heat and the attention to this issue faded, before players and recruits lost faith, before coaching contracts and, and, and so that we still have a, play, a team to play uh, when we are successful um, in reinstatement. We also kept our, our sights set on this longer term goal of preserving this opportunity for generations to come and the long, the lifelong impact that we all know field hockey has on leadership um, and resilience. This is just a pause from like our nerd nation as we call ourselves. It's just a quick example of some of the stakeholder analysis that we did internally in thinking about where were the pressure points. It's an example of something that you hopefully can apply um, within your own institution and it may be a useful way, a framework to approach that for yourself. So when Stanford decided to cut the programs originally, one of the factors we believed played a role um, among the what, field hockey being picked among the 11 sports was because we had historically low levels of participation um, and, and total giving in terms of contribution, financial contributions as alumni. So this phenomenon among women isn't really unique to Stanford or to sports as a philanthropic cause. Women are less likely to give and give substantially. And so one could argue that this is a factor of a persistent wage gap making 81 cents on a dollar, but really that gap isn't explained why when, for example, the men's wrestling team has already raised $12 million with a much smaller team and a much shorter history, raised 2.8 million to date. So when we set our goals for our campaign, it's important to, to think about them strategically, practically, and personally. And so strategically, I say, because we, We've always, um, we always have assumed that money would matter um, practically because we wanted to create an endowment that was large enough to generate uh, enough interest to cover the annual operating costs of the team, including salaries, scholarships, um, et cetera. 20 million seems like an enormous number. It is a big number, but when you think about um, it in, in terms of a $53,000 a year tuition to go to Stanford, um, the cost of living in Palo Alto, which is 50% higher than the US, and all the cross-country travel that the team needs to engage in to play and lead play, um, that's, that's our best estimate of what is needed to, to permanently endow the team. Um, that will play out differently in your markets um, in, with your tuition, et cetera. So, and the goal also needed to be personal. It needed to be team-oriented so that every contribution mattered um, and you know, and that everybody was all in. In fact, one of the first questions that big donors ask is what percentage of your base is participating to really be a reflection of how badly uh, we want it. So we've mapped out this path to 20 million um, and Elise will talk a little bit in a minute about how we have begun to tackle this enormous challenge. Um, we obviously have made progress with a third of our alumni participating and are reaching a $2.8 million threshold so far. Um, one of the takeaway insights here is to maintain uh, an independent list of your donors so that you can steward them, write thank you notes, and really over time promote a culture of giving among your alums, to vote with their pocketbooks, to stand up and give. So with this um, as our high level strategy now, Elise is gonna dig into some of the operational, um, organizational and communication efforts. So I'll turn it over to Elise. Thanks, Allison, and thanks for everyone for joining this call. Um, also, it's about time for my dog to go out on a walk, so you might hear him just freaking out in the background, um, but we're going to get through it. Uh, so what we're looking at here on this slide is kind of a deep dive into some of the lessons that we've learned specifically regarding organization and communication. So after the decision was announced, we started trying to organize an effort to fight it. And the first thing we realized is that we only had a partial list of contact information for alumni from the Stanford Development Office. 
So we had to scramble to try and find up-to-date contacts to first update everyone on what had happened. And then from there, we launched a survey to find out more about our alumni's skills, connections, and their willingness to help in our efforts. Um, so with all that in mind, these are some lessons learned as far as organization goes. Uh, so first, keep your alum contact information current and know that you might not always be able to rely on your school to do that for you. Um, another item here is maintaining an independent list of donors like Allison mentioned. Um, like the contact list, you can't always rely on the university sharing these with you. Um, or in the case of Stanford, where the university and athletic department didn't do any donor cultivation or reach out to donors before making this decision, it's increasingly important to have that information um, independent of the university. Uh, another item to highlight here is that surveying your alums and understanding your own history, diversity, talents, and the accomplishments of your alums can help you always have a case for why field hockey should be a program and not just help give you a case after the fact. Um, as Allison mentioned, there are a lot of stakeholders and decisions that happen at universities and really understanding the skills and influence of your alums can help you create a strategy if this happens to your program uh, or maybe even a proactive strategy. Um, other lessons we wanted to highlight really go beyond hockey. So looking at that like transition out of college or out of hockey for most student athletes and into the real world, uh, that, that transition can be really tough. And so there's a lot of opportunities to really harness the collective wisdom of your alumni and help mentor or network with current student athletes. Um, it was really astounding, something that was really surprising to me when we surveyed our alums, just like how awesome and badass everyone is. Um, and so as we designed our alumni, or we defined our alumni network, we were really able to set our structure and organization um, and, and do that in a way that really harnessed people's skills. And we'll cover that in the next slide. So if you wanna to go to the next slide. Cool, all right. So um, this is like a high level look at our organization. Um, so to achieve our goals of doing outreach, sustaining pressure and raising an endowment, we started by defining key functions which you see on the left there. Um, and then we matched those with alumni skills, which were identified in our team survey. So we ended up with five different buckets. We've got strategy, outreach, communications, finance, and legal. And from these functions, an organization emerged, which you see on the right. Um, so right now we're all focused on the fundraising, fundraising campaign uh, with the exception of legal because they were looking at Title IX claims, but those don't appear to be a viable angle for our team right now, but might be for yours someday. Um, hopefully not though, hopefully you never get to that point. Um, but looking or diving a little bit deeper into the organization, we have three main groups. So the first is major gifts where we have alumni, alumni with fundraising experience, kind of prospecting and cultivating individual high capacity donors from within and beyond our team. Uh, the second group is alumni outreach, um, which we've been doing through what we're calling class champions, basically a person per decade that is responsible for disseminating information and doing outreach to individuals within their decade. And then the third bucket here is the broader hockey community. So like everyone on this call um, with whom we have the opportunity to connect with um, and also like share information. But at the end, we'll have kind of a call to action, give some action items. Um, so really highlighting here that knowing the talents and skills among your alumni and leveraging them in a proactive engage in proactive engagement and potentially fundraising could provide some valuable protection for your program. Um, and just given our experience, it, I just want to underscore that this is a lot more difficult to do when you're just like figuring it out on the fly. So highlight the proactive part of that. All right, we'll go to the next slide. So um, I also wanted to briefly touch on our communications approach. Um, as we got started, we realized that there are a lot of different preferences in communication, especially across generations. So one of our first goals was setting up cha uh, channels on different platforms. And um, it's important to note that when the decision to cut the teams was announced, university-run media messaging was stopped for all of the cut teams. So those teams don't have access to those accounts now. Um, so it's, it's really important to consider having independent channels of communication going 
whether it's an email list or an alumni run Facebook page or a parent slash fan Twitter account, it's, it's really important to have that be independent or something independent. Um, it's also important to consider the diversity of media coverage that your team is currently getting. I think it's really important to demonstrate your team or your alumni's contributions beyond the pitch. Um, and we tried to do this by creating some alumni spotlight videos to show how the challenges that field hockey gave us in college can actually lead to forms of resilience and leadership later in life for a lot of our alums. Um, and go to the next slide. Um, so again, reiterating and kind of summarizing how important alumni engagement is. Um, getting people involved requires providing them information and opportunities to be connected. Uh, we've been using Zoom, like this call, to engage with our alums through all hands calls. Um, and it's a lot of work organizing people, uh, but consider that there might be some super crazy involved alums, like me maybe, um, who would be willing to organize and and lead efforts for alumni engagement. And um, those alums could even manage those independent communication channels or, or go deeper with like alumni games, reunions, newsletters, team meetings, et cetera, um, to just help distribute the workload for alumni engagement so it doesn't fall directly on the coaching staff shoulders. Um, as an example of how important alumni engagement is, I'd like to highlight one of our alums and lead donors, uh, Dr. Christina Johnson who's on this slide here, like kind of the big picture in the middle there. Um, so she's currently the president of the Ohio State University and she's helped immensely with our campaign and as a university president knows how impactful different pieces of our strategy can be for university leadership. So one of the biggest pieces is public pressure in the form of letter writing and media coverage and not just sending one letter each, but having a steady stream of letters and pressure coming at the university from all around the world can be really effective. Um, and so I think another important thing to highlight is like in a, on a different note, like remember that your alums also include past coaches who are able to provide support behind the scenes and help connect people like they did when they were coaching um, and that the support of past and current Stanford coaches has been really helpful for us as we navigate this situation. So also wanna underscore that. Um, and we can go to the next slide. All right. um, so media pressure has been really big and helpful. Uh, so reaching out and talking to journalists or we had our alumni send letters to, letters to the editor of our alumni magazine. That's, that's really helped our strategy of sustaining public pressure on Stanford. Um, uh, as I mentioned before, having independent channels of communication, but also independent relationships with non-university media people can be beneficial. So those connections can help you fight for your sport or showcase stories about your team later on, um, or just goes beyond what the university writes in its own media about you. Um, and as far as media attention goes, there's, as we all know, there's a lot going on in the world right now. Um, and diversity and inclusion is up front and center. And I think we have to be honest with ourselves about the traditional lack of diversity in many of the sports that ended up being cut in the Stanford situation. And so this is another reason why understanding your alums and your history can help you not only make sure that your future looks more diverse than your past, but also help you break down the stereotypes of why people think your program or, or who people think your program includes or excludes. Um, so consider different elements of diversity too, not like, so looking at race, identity, socioeconomic diversity, geographical diversity, religion, sexual orientation, there's always an opportunity to diversify and further celebrate the diversity on your team. And with your media strategy, definitely consider telling the stories of those on your team that go beyond just the on-field accomplishments. Um, let's see. Oh, another thing we wanted to highlight was that because multiple teams got cut in the Stanford situation, we've garnered more media attention, I think, than if just one team got cut. Um, and working together with the other teams has really helped us a lot. And uh, Kathy Levinson is going to kind of tell us a little bit more about what that collaboration has looked like and some of the most recent updates on our situation. So 
with that, I will hand it off to Kathy. So when they cut the 11 teams, the first thing we did is to reach out to some of the other teams. And what we learned is that some of the teams decided they were willing to go the club route. And so they were not anxious to be fighting for retaining their varsity status. There were other teams who wanted to go it alone. They quickly moved into fundraising mode and wanted to go for their own survival. And I think we all uh, kind of looked insularly and internally and to say, what can we do? And what we learned is we couldn't do it alone. So the 11 Cut Sports formed a group called the Stanford Athletic Response Team, SART. And we got together, we had representatives from all those sports to talk, to talk about shared best practices. How are you reaching out to your alums? How are you doing your fundraising? Um, how are you, how, how are you uh, approaching the legal situation? And we all met regularly with representatives of every team so that we could present a united front. So that was a great start. And I would just say as a lesson learned, it would have been great if we had already had relationships with all those sports. So not only do today's players not necessarily have relationships with players on the other teams, but we as alums, didn't have relationships with alums from the other team. So we had to form those relationships just from this, um, just from this unfortunate situation that brought us together. So as this group of 11 got started, we realized that we were really the victims in this. And it was clear that the university was separating, um, it was separating the 25 kept sports from the 11 cut sports. They were telling the 25 kept sports, don't worry, you're going to get more money because we got rid of 11 and the 11 stopped getting any kinds of resources. And so the university really tried to bifurcate the kept and the non-kept. And we got, as, as one of the 11, I certainly got so many calls from alums and all, of all sports saying, what the hell is going on? And as a longtime donor and activist in the field hockey community, particularly at Stanford, I didn't have any advance notice either, which these athletes were shocked about. And the end result of this was after several weeks of conversation with kept sports, we formed a group called 36 Sports Strong. And so we had advocates from all 36 sports, including the 25 that were not cut join our efforts to demand reinstatement. And in that group of 36, we included the, the most, they're all important. Two of the most important are what I call representatives them forever safe sports, football and men's basketball, the two revenue generating sports. So we have representative from those two as well as the other 34. Among a 36 group, uh, 36 sports strong, we have 35 Olympians. We have 17 Stanford Athletic Hall of Famers. We have a four time Pro Bowl selection. We have two women's soccer World Cup champions, a major league baseball Hall of Famer, two current and former record holders, four tennis and golf Grand Slam winners, and two NBA veterans. Their notable professional profiles, name recognition, and connections, including in the media, have been invaluable. And frankly, the university's lack of response to them has made them just as angry and frustrated as those of us in the 11 sports. So forming those relationships before you need it is definitely one of our lessons learned. If you'd go on to the next one slide, please. So by combining with the other sports, we also learned a lot. We learned that we represent very little of the ex athletic expense 
of the university. We represent 6.5 million, but represent a third of the athletes. So you can see that we really did not get cut because of financial shortfall. When you put all those red arrows together, we don't even equal the total cost of, for example, women's tennis. So it's, while they say it's a financial decision and that if we raise $200 million, they'll bring us back, we've been able to get to the bottom of the numbers and it does, just doesn't hold water. In year one, the university actually only saves about $4.7 million and their deficit this year in athletics was 25 million. So financial, Financial problem is the publicized problem, but we actually don't think it's really the core issue. But the, the message here is that we would not have gotten to the bottom of this without collaborating with all the other sports. So I would encourage all of you to make sure that you know what your annual budgets are and you know what you need for the future years. You might even think about doing a, a, a best case scenario, a worst case scenario, and a mid-range scenario so that you really know how your numbers work. It was only uh, about two years ago that the Stanford um, field hockey team had the opportunity to go to Australia. And to go to Australia was uh, very important in the team's development. But at the same time, if we had had under understanding that the team was possibly going to be cut, then possibly we could have made a different choice about that. And if you'd go to the last one. So all of us coming together in 36 sports strong, we have talked to not only the president, provost, and athletic director, but we were able to uh, get a meeting with the chair of the board of trustees, as well as the head, head of the uh, subcommittee on athletics from the board and the longest serving board member. And we made a proposal that said, bring all 11 sports back for five years, which is about how many years you'd give a brand new coach to get all of their uh, recruits in before you got rid of them if you were gonna do that. So we've asked for five years to raise our money. In fact, in just the last six months, we've raised $40 million in pledges among these 11 sports with no help from Stanford. In fact, I would say it's anti-help from Stanford. They're making it very difficult. And that money was raised because of the relationships that we have with our, our teammates. We also asked for them to do an immediate audit of the Stanford Athletic Department to look at how it's structured and how money is spent. And we made a proposal that actually, not only should these 11 sports become self-funding, but because it happened to these 11, it could easily happen to the other 23 that are also not revenue positive. So we think that getting all 34 sports self-endowed is really key and allowing the men's basketball team and the football team to keep their profits within their teams. So we are not reliant on them for how big our budgets can be. In fact, this proposal is very consistent with what the Knight Commission's recommendation was, which is to separate out the Power Five football teams from the NC2A and have their own league and then have all the other sports under the NC2A. So it's the structure we recommended. It's hard to believe that they wouldn't accept that. We haven't yet gotten them to do it but it would allow them to then run a revenue positive athletic program. And even now, after they cut these 11 sports with the pathway that we're on, the Stanford Athletic Department is gonna to continue to run uh, at a deficit. So this is the plan we've proposed. We have put an immediate deck together 
and that media deck got sent out to the press last week. And I expect you'll be reading more about that um, in the days and weeks ahead. Let me just wrap up by saying, um, uh, here's a, a really a snapshot of the lessons learned that we've tried to highlight along the way. Keeping close and independent tabs on your alums, um, not letting your team or its members be forgettable on or off the field before or after graduation, making sure all their contributions are, are being noticed, uh, being very strategic about the relationships that you create and maintain um, among influential, influential decision makers, donors, um, trustees, et cetera, creating allies with other teams that, that Kathy just, um, just highlighted, to see early signs of stress, to share best practices, to keep an eye on Title IX um, violations, which is certainly proven powerful for other programs, and getting really serious about fundraising, um, having 100% uh, commitment to, make, to show how every alumni values the program. Um, and just to reiterate that, you know, none of these skills or activities are likely what drew you to your coaching career. Um, these are not the stats that will mark your career, but they are the skills that can make and preserve and protect your team. So I hope that the transparency about our journey is um, useful to you all in protecting um, and preserving your program. We just want to close our message by, um, thanking you for your attention and your participation and to ask for your help. Uh, we can't do this alone. Um, as Simon pointed out, we are, are all connected. This is about Stanford. This is about West Coast hockey. This is about all collegiate hockey. This is about hockey at the high school, um, collegiate uh, level and beyond, it, and it ripples across the country. So um, we want to first ask if you'll consider making a financial pledge. We can't establish an endowment yet without Stanford's permission, but we need to demonstrate our capacity um, and get their attention. So we're asking for pledges. These are non-binding gestures to show your support. They can easily be modified as your circumstances change. And no pledge is too small. Every dollar counts. Um, so if you would consider an amount that's commensurate with your capacity to give and the value that you derive from this information and how important you think this is for field hockey overall, we would be grateful. Second, we're also asking you to speak up, um, to contact Stanford officials. They need to know that this decision has impacted the whole country and entire sport. So um, one of the things that you'll see in the chat that uh, my colleague Linda De Los Rios has, has uh, posted in there, if you open up this link, you'll see a very easy way to click a button that'll generate an email to all of our officials with a temp some templated language that we encourage you to modify and personalize to tell your connection to field hockey and why this decision matters to you, to your team, to your community. Um, and so we really value your, um, your help in sustaining the pressure um, and staying in the grill, as we say. Next, we'd also ask that you activate your teams, your networks, your club teams, your parents, your alumni. Um, this, I think, is an opportunity for a lesson in advocacy, um, for teamwork beyond your locker room, um, and to pay it forward. And lastly, we'd encourage you to join our social channels um, to follow our journey and help us sustain the public pressure. Um, there are links to all of our Facebook, Instagram, mailing list, et cetera, and we'd encourage you to share like, post, repost, um, all those good things. So again, thank you um, for your attention. Field hockey is certainly more than a sport. It's a family. And so now more than ever, we need to stick together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Allison, Elise, Kathy, Linda, all of you, Melissa, who I know is, has been very active, really appreciate all you are doing. Um, obviously, what you're doing is so relevant to everyone on this call, and that's evident in the um, what we're hearing on the chat. So we we really appreciate that, and I'm sure you're going to be getting a lot of you know questions, and really encourage everyone to you know take action to help and support. So with that, I would like to turn it over to talk about the California State Chapter, which is a pilot program that we are starting in a number of different states and specifically to the president of the California State Chapter, who is Kendall Beveridge. 
So Kendall, if I can turn it to you, I'd greatly appreciate it. Like Sally said, my name is Kendall Beveridge. I live in San Francisco and I am the president of the California State Chapter of USA Field Hockey. This is a new way that USA Field Hockey is organizing itself. We know that um, there is too much work to be done in every pocket of the country for the central organization to take care of it all. And we also know that California has some pretty unique challenges and opportunities. So we started this state chapter maybe about a year ago. We've been talking about it for much longer than that. Um, and I have the privilege and pleasure to lead our all volunteer organization. Um, all I will say this evening is that we are still in kind of startup mode. We have a president, myself, a vice president, Nicole Ng, a Northern California regional director and a Southern California regional director. Um, we've been kind of doing a lot of the getting organized work and have had um, some, some town hall meetings and have surveyed our community. And we are ready to get things moving and set up some um, task, force, task forces around some specific projects and some needs. First and foremost, we need a communications director, um, someone to lead the communications committee. And that person is really the only thing we need you to be is someone who lives in California, is a part of this community and has some of the skills um, to lead a group of people. You don't have to do all the communicating yourself, but you need to kind of lead the charge. So um, I am going to drop a link in the chat and that if you live in California, so this is not relevant to everybody, but if you live in California and you wanna stay involved in California State Chapter Field Hockey, um, that is the way to sign up to kind of get more information from us about how to be more, more directly involved. Um, other than that, I am going to hand this back to the team for any Q&A and really happy that everyone's coming together to have this conversation tonight. Great, Kendall, thank you so much for your for volunteering. You've been an amazing president of the California State Chapter so far and have been such a great asset to USA Field Hockey. So I wanna thank you for that. And with that, I'd like to turn it back to Simon and Chip for any other questions for a wrap up and a quick next steps. Sure, thank you again all for everybody who has joined this call as we work together to navigate this. A couple of questions that have come up um, over the course of the last couple of weeks as we started to announce this was uh, to the Safe Stanford team, what additional advice do you have for learning how to navigate the financial or political landscape of a university environment? If you have any advice as far as how to start focusing that and really laying the groundwork to prepare for that. I think uh, one of the things that's really important is to find mentors, of current coaches of other teams at the university. I think universities are unique and strange entities. And so to find out how other coaches do their budgets, who their budget resources are, rather than you being at effect of whatever your admin tells you. So I think mentorship from people who have, coaches who have been at the university is a really valuable resource. Thank you, Kathy. Um, next question, you talked about the development of a, an alumni association. Um, that was something you, you hadn't had before. And so can you talk a little bit about, about how you founded it, in essence, how you got it building up and way that you are preserving it? We are building the plane as, we, as we're flying it. And so it is, not, is yet to be formalized um, in a structure. We'd love the opportunity to do that, but we're, we are working on volunteer um, sweat equity and delighted to have the hands of many um, behind the work that you saw today. I don't know if Lisa or Kathy have additional comments on that. I guess the follow-up to that was your, I guess your, your contact list, was that something you developed through your own, just reaching out through your contacts and extending those, that list to make sure you hit all the alums over the course of time? I can speak to that one. Um, so we had a list already, um, partially given to us from the, the development office at Stanford. Um, but after we realized that it really wasn't fully complete, we actually ended up scraping the alumni database for any 
anyone who was ever affiliated with field hockey. And then even then we still found as we started reaching out directly to alums, they were like, oh, have you, have you heard from this person? Have you heard from this person? Um, our, our program was founded in 1903. So we have quite a number of alums, um, you know, of many different ages right now. I think actually someone on this call that I saw is one of our oldest alums, Shirley Kelly, who I think is 96, um, which is awesome. Like they're here on the call and they care about field hockey, obviously. Um, but it really took a lot of, of networking to figure out who was missing, where people are, and how we can get a hold of them. But we, we pursued many channels. Yeah, there's obviously a lot of work uh, has gone into that. And it's great to see that those numbers continuing to grow uh, for you all. Um, I would just add that we had, we uh, formed class, we created class champions to help us do that outreach by decades so we could find people who had played with each other and then take responsibility for connecting with people in that generation. What, ha, had they given you any kind of indication as far as a core issue in deciding those 11 sports? I know that, you know, they publicly claimed finances, um, did not work. You, you seem to see that finances are not the core issue. But There's been no more direction given. They've been clear that we need to raise $200 million, which is really an absurd number. Um, and it doesn't solve the deficit problem. But there, there is some sense that they didn't want as great a percentage of scholar athletes at the university. They wanted to have more admissions flexibility than they had. And you saw that in the Dartmouth decision as well. When they reinstated, they mentioned in their FAQ that there were some financial irregularities. There were some Title IX issues where they had to do more research and that they had wanted greater admissions flexibility. And we have a sense that that's true at Stanford as well. So there's 250 athletes who's, to be specific, there were 240 athletes whose, whose athletics career were terminated and will not be available for athletic spots going forward. Stanford had roughly 12% of its athletes in, in uh, excuse me, 12% of its uh, undergrads as athletes. And there was some, there are some rumors that they wanted that number less than 10%. Next question um, was any ideas to why they seem to skip over sports in that expense column to target field hockey when there might've been other sports in between? A couple of those sports, for example, women's and men's tennis are fully endowed and they specifically got endowed several years ago to prevent this from happening to their sports. So they were safer. A second reason is that there, honestly, there are more notable alums in some of the other sports. And so we think they saw greater potential for uh, financial contributions going, future, going forward. Um, and the third would be that Stanford belongs to the Pac-12 as in most of its sports and not for field hockey because other than Cal, there aren't any other Pac-12 uh, schools that play field hockey. So Stanford is forced to go east for all of its travels. And so they did say that because there's so little competition out west and the expenses are much greater to have to go east all the time, that that was one of the elements. To the group at large, um, what has been your biggest takeaway um, and your, 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 the, the biggest piece you would give to a program who to be prepared? If it can happen at Stanford, it can happen anywhere. Um, with an, a university with the resources it has and a, and a long, deep commitment to athletics and women's athletics in particular and field hockey being the longest uh, sports tradition on campus, it can happen anywhere. And I think the, the sort of partner um, message with that is to be proactive about building um, those redundancies in your communication um, and keeping your alumni and your team close uh, to, to, as a protective strategy. As well as really 
reaching out within your peer circle at the university so that you've developed relationships with your fellow coaches and staff in the athletic department. So you're not just insular focused on your team. Uh, turn it back over to Simon, um, who will address a couple next steps that USA Field Hockey is partaking as well as Sally. It's, it's inspiring to see how many people care about this really important issue. Um, so that's a, a big takeaway. Um, in working over these past couple of years more closely with Sally, with the USAPC and, and the other NGBs, in particular what's happened since COVID, there's, there's this theme that if you're invis invisible, you're vulnerable. And it's come up again um, this evening several times. And I'm wondering, first of all, we'd love to hear from you directly or after the call. Please do engage with us, with, with Liz, with Sally. You know how passionate they are, the chip. Um, what can, where, where can you see USA feel like you can make an impact? So please, please be more engaged and, and see how we can um, really apply our resources best. And going back to that topic of, of being visible, it's really important. And I'm wondering what role we can play in sharing more best practice, um, and having uh, seminars going forward, um, sharing and spotlighting some other programs that have had some really good successes. Dartmouth has come up more recently, and, and there, there are several others of how they have made themselves really visible internally within, within their institution and externally with alumni and more. And I think there's, I, I have heard several times that compared to other sports, other similar team sports, female team sports, we're, we're not as aggressive, just frankly, we're not. We're not as aggressive as, we, as some of the others. And I think we can do better as a sport from being more proactive, getting into more positions of influence. Um, and, and USC feel like he can play a role in sharing that best practice, advocating. The other piece I wanted to touch on, so, so that's an action point I think we need to consider going forward, but I'm interested to hear some, some responses. Can we play that role? The, the other piece that I see is, is, is being part of USC feel like being part of this infrastructure and continue to do what we're doing in terms of helping shape it for field hockey's benefit with, our bias on it. Um, and I think what the conversations that have been going on about have been about how can each individual program increase revenues, decrease costs. And a lot of that has come to separating um, our sport. And there's a little bit, Kathy talked about it in some one way earlier, but in separating our sport from um, men's, men's football, men's basketball, and not having the same levels of regulation. So having more appropriate regulations around uh, recruitment, scheduling, um, involvement with youth sports that can lead to revenue for the program and others. So we can continue to advocate for that because th those are areas that seem to um, could make a big difference in the longer term for the health and sustainability of field hockey programs. Thank you, Simon. I really, again, appreciate everyone's being on the call tonight. And um, as we uh, reconvene to discuss you know, this, I think following up with some next steps to continue this conversation and to continue the actions, really encourage everyone on this call to please share the word. Um, we will share the recording. Um, please take action, um, as Allison said, on the four areas to support Stanford directly. Um, Stanford, we care. We also care about University of Pacific and Hendricks and many of the other programs that have recently, you know, been, been dropped. <laughs> and um, really try and step forward and see what we can do to help support um, and to advocate for the programs and also to share this relevant information with existing programs on how they can best protect and preserve their program by tooting their own horse, their own horn to the appropriate administrators, uh, alumni, um, community to make field hockey more visible than ever. So um, Chip, do you have anything to add before we um, sign off for the night? No, I'd like to thank everybody for being a part of this dialogue. And I think that it just reminds us the importance of vigilance. You know, how important it is to have these conversations regularly with administrators, uh, with colleagues, and to make sure that we are working together uh, for the development of the game. You know, our, our focus has to be for the good of the game constantly. And uh, I'm very much appreciative of the, the, the work this group has already done to give us more information and more blueprints moving forward. Agreed. So thank you again, all, and um, look forward to continuing the conversation. Uh, please 
stay involved and we will be in touch soon. So thank you very much.